Today we are at our fourth core value. Uh, we're in a series going through six. The first core value we remember is heartfelt hospitality. We talked about abundant generosity. And last week it was all about being a porta potty church, right? Uh, some of you say, what? If you were not here, you need to hear that message. To see where are we? Somewhere between a casserole church and a porta potty church. Okay? Got you hooked? So get online and listen to last week's sermon where we talk about what hospitality really means around here. Today we're talking about our fourth value, and that fourth value is bold faith shared. I got uh, and see, there we are. I used to teach a course at Duke's course of study program, and the first day of the class, I would uh, welcome the students and say, okay, we're going to begin by playing some word association. I'm going to put one word up here on the, uh, on the board, and then I want you to give me your first reaction to it. Don't think about it. Just kind of give me your first reaction to it, okay? So this is what I did. So I would ramp on the board this word right here. Evangelism. Okay. Tell me, what do you think? And these soon-to-be preachers said, confrontation, argue, judgmental, personal witnessing. Makes me nervous. What do I say? Isn't that the preacher's job? And I said, yeah, that is a preacher. That's what you are about to be, uh, the preacher's job. Um, there was not a universal kind of embracing of the word if, when it was just come from a, uh, a gut level response. The word itself seemed to have some baggage to them. <laughs> Irene and I used to go to NC State football games and... Um, uh, for several years, when we go in the main gate, there would always be the same guy there. He was wild-eyed, had a long beard, usually had a sign, sign said something like, turn or burn, and he was always preaching, repent, you sinners, you are going to hell. And, and every, he was there, and he had just in your face. And I was like, man, it's a little bold, until I, I discovered he was only preaching that to the Carolina friends. <laughs> 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 in sharing his faith. Years ago, there was a national campaign, and uh, that campaign was called I Found It. Everyone was uh, encouraged to wear lapel pins or little stickers that said I Found It. There were uh, bumper stickers issued out to, to anybody that would put one on the back of their car. It was in uh, uh, yellow with bold black words that said I Found It. There were billboards, I Found It. And uh, the church where I was associate pastor, they were all into it. Good vote. I decided not to put one on my car. Uh, it just seemed to me that that was saying, I got it, you ain't, you know? I have something that you don't have, or I somehow intrinsically better. I, I don't, anyway, it, to me, so when I chose not to do that, was I less bold than I should have been? In our culture today, it seems to me that the idea of evangelism or personal witnessing or sharing one's faith often brings with it some memory of negative pressuring techniques where a person is wrestled into repeating some kind of a formula and then everything is fine after that. You know, the easiest way for a pastor to elicit guilt in a congregation is to ask people, have you been sharing your faith this week? Have you been talking to your friends, your neighbors, your, uh, your closest associates at work, the, uh, your friends at school? Have you been witnessing? Show of hands. No. Aren't you glad we're not all going to be held accountable this morning? Or are we boldly sharing our faith? However, if bold faith sharing is one of our core values, and the thought of it, just doing it, makes some Christians blood freeze, what could it possibly mean? Maybe we need to get a better working definition. Let's kind of unpack one of the great evangelism texts in Scripture. It's, uh, it's when Jesus was about to return to the Father. It's called the Great Commission, and it's found in Matthew chapter 28. And uh, I'll read from beginning with the 16th verse. Now, the eleven disciples went to Galilee. That's where they were from. To the mountains which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, that's Jesus, they worshipped him, but some doubted. 
Really? I mean, these are the 11. They've been through everything, and yet some of them are still dead. Verse 18. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And remember, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Hmm. Jesus begins by saying, all authority is given to me. The Christians, we believe that, and that gives us a foundation upon which to stand. Jesus has all authority given to him from God the Creator. With that basis, he says to his 11, some of them still wondering, um, therefore go and make disciples. Now they knew that a disciple is a learner who incorporates gradually the likeness of the master of all nations. This is to be all-inclusive, not just to their, uh, to their friends in Galilee, but to all nations. Baptizing them means more than getting them wet and saying some words over them. It means immersing them in the reality of God. It means helping people to soak in, to marinate in the things of God in becoming a disciple. And then he says, and teach them to obey everything that I've commanded you. This is discipleship. Teaching them the way of Jesus. I'm convinced that we have many people in the church who are members of the church who identify themselves as Christians but who have never been invited onto the journey of becoming a disciple of Jesus. A disciple is a learner who's going through a process of change. Of change, it's an exchange process where I exchange me at the center of everything about my life, all about me and, and my stuff, to where Jesus is at the center and it's all about him. Discipleship is that exchange process. And you know the things that we moan about, rightly so, I think, um, and talk about in our culture, such as pornography, drugs, divorce, materialism, long living. These are things that can only be dealt with effectively if there's a change at the core of a person, at the spirit at the motivational center that has to be healed. To try to impose change reflecting only on outward behavior is to set yourself up for failure. You know, so many times I've had people say to me, oh, you know, preacher, when I stop drinking, I'm going to start coming to church. <laughs> That's not the right order. It's not about coming to church anyway. Come to Jesus and he'll help you deal with that stuff. You know, I just love it when uh, the Pope says that uh, this weekend that the um, church is to be like a, um, a field hospital. And communion is not so much privilege of the members as it is medicine for the sick. And those are the words. You know, Jesus rarely talked about believing doctrine right. I mean, read through the Gospels. Almost never. But he constantly talks about loving right and living right. Jesus taught by gesture. That's what they're talking about, what the Pope is doing, is he goes around and uh, meets with prisoners and, and, and kisses, kisses uh, people who are uh, terribly uh, handicapped. He's, he's, by gesture, he is illustrating the right way. Um, Jesus healed a blind man. He didn't heal all the blind men in the world, but he healed the blind man that was in front of him. He healed a, um, a, a distraught father's daughter who was on the point of death. Jesus sat down with a man who was filled with conflicting spirits called a legion. I feel like there's a thousand competing things inside of me. And Jesus sat down with him and asked him his name and got the man can you imagine Jesus walking around 
and touching and hugging and healing lepers. You know, in that culture, that time, if a person had leprosy, the requirement was that they had to stay outside of the village. And if they came close to anyone, like if they had to go get water or something, they had to cover their mouth and scream, leper! And Jesus broke through that and touched them. There were times that Jesus compassionately and with forgiveness. Sat down with a woman who was taken in adultery. Doesn't say anything about the man, but sat down with the woman and freed her from the judgment of that crowd of men. Jesus taught by, by gesture. Um, and, and when people want to say, okay, Jesus, well, just make it clear. Who's in and who's out of your kingdom? So it'll be clear. Who's in and who's out? He said, these things. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me in. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you came and visited me. In prison, and you came to me and ministered to me. And he said, what? Jesus, when did we do that? And he said, when you did it to the least of my brothers and sisters. He did it to me. And Jesus, brothers and sisters, are everybody on the planet. Hmm. So let me suggest that bold faith sharing is learning how to love the Jesus way. And that makes church, then, is a school of love in which we enroll ourselves and our families to learn how to love in the world that we inhabit. Not somebody else's world, but right here. Monkey Junction world. Or Leland or wherever you live. <laughs> okay? And this, this laboratory of love, where the church is, is the laboratory, is not a uh, kind of a six-week course. It's, it's a life journey. Where we learn how to love in the real. A friend of mine has a church Great church. And their mission statement is making God's love real. Pretty good one, huh? Mm -hmm. um, there's a guy who uh, poured, uh, poured a new driveway. And while the, uh, the cement was still, was still wet, he, he went inside and he looked out. And there were some neighborhood kids and they were putting their hand palm prints. <laughs> and he went, aren't you kids get out of here, man? And he yelled at them. And his wife said, I thought you love kids. He said, well, I do love children in the abstract, but not in the concrete. <laughs> For you, yeah, no, yeah. Don't want to preach a joke. Uh, you know, a lot of times we Christians love in the abstract. We sing in the abstract, but what about the concrete? What about when it gets to read the way Jesus loved? Hmm. But you know, the thing is, Anybody that I know who dares to love, not the abstract, but in the concrete, who actually reaches out in love and cares for somebody, it comes back to them as joy. Not as obligation. It comes, I mean, really, do you ever talk to somebody who said, you know, I went and did that thing the church wanted me to do, to kind of do something like this, and boy, that was such a drag. Usually they come back and say, wow, you know, I feel like I made a difference. Whether it's delivering for, uh, for Meals on Wheels or Packing food and giving it to, to folks who are a bunch of guys going off and, and helping somebody fix up their house. Um, any, any manner of things. Um, creating food kits for, uh, or, 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 uh, like the women did uh, yesterday. Uh, health kits for uh, folks who are kind of caught in the human trafficking kind of thing. Um, that releases joy within you as you engage after the manner of Jesus. I think it's because when we do that, we're living in sync with the truth about life. We were, we were made to cooperate with what God is doing.
to restore all things. Bold faith shared today um, is a demonstration of the faith. And each of us has a part in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16. Um, it says, He makes the whole body, the body mean, meaning Jesus' followers, fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work. In other words, not everybody can sing a solo like Jeff did. You know? This morning. He's do, that's his part. And yeah, not everybody can outrun a camera like we have. Uh, she's doing her part. Or serve a cup of coffee with, with love and compassion like we do out there. You know? It goes on and on. Um, so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. When we're all doing our part, then we're healthy as a church. Long ago, Jesus called his followers to stop judging and to start forgiving. To stop living selfishly and to start serving others. You know, maybe that could be, let's look at this next slide here. Um, the Jesus way would be to love well and live differently. I just kind of like that phrase. That's, that's what we're called to love well. If we love well, that means we're going to be living differently. Um, our daily priorities and our actions will change. We begin to invest in our community. We love our neighbors. We serve one another. The movement then that Jesus started and the movement known as Harvard Church invites you to do just that. Um, here's where the Harvard Church movement invites you to do. First, it invites you to know love. Um, in 1 John 4, 11. It said, Beloved, since God loves us so much, we also ought to love one another. God is love. Imitate that. So we begin with knowing God's love ourselves. And then, what would it be like if we decide to love everyone? Even the people you don't like. Really? Hmm. Bring up an image of somebody inside it into your mind that you don't like. Well, that one. <laughs> I don't know how you get out of that. Jesus says, love your enemies. Here's what he said in Luke 6, 27. But I say to you, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. See, he was talking about a movement that wasn't just going to be nice. A movement that is going to change the world. That's, that's the whole plan. Okay. So then, let's talk about embodying love. Let's embody love. It's, it's make love real. I was reading, I just started reading a, a, a new book by Nick Kristoff. He's one of my favorite uh, writers. He, he writes for the New York Times. Uh, he and his wife uh, wrote a, uh, uh, a new book it's called A Path Appears. A Path Appears. And it's about uh, social entrepreneurs. And it's just a, uh, it, it's a collection of stories about regular people, just like you and me, who, who decided to do something specific, concrete for others. He begins with this great story about this nine-year-old girl who somehow, um, I think maybe in school, she learns that there are children living in poverty who are, who are prone to disease because they don't have clean water. They don't have access to clean water. Um, and we know this, that to be true. And when, when, when people don't have access to clean water, parasites, disease, and all manner of terrible things. Um, and, and children uh, that, that drink uh, polluted water don't develop their brains. It's just, so this little girl decided that she wanted to do something. So she uh, started, a, uh, a, she wanted to raise $300 uh, by the time she had her birthday. For her birthday, $300, so that she could send it to a ministry that was digging freshwater wells in Ethiopia. And she did a lot of things, it got the word out, and uh, she uh, raised about 200 And she thought that was great, but she was kind of disappointed, that, so she was still thinking of ways, when tragically she was involved in, a, in an accident. And uh, she was... Um, uh, seriously, seriously injured in the hospital 
But the word kind of got out. This is where social media can just uh, pray for this little girl. And by the way, her heart's desire is to raise money uh, for freshwater wells. Uh, and it went out, and uh, she never did recover. But by the time uh, she passed, and in her memory, over $1.2 million had been raised. A year later, her mother went to Ethiopia, or from Ethiopia and saw villages up to, I think it's 39,000 people had access to fresh, clean, clear water. All because of her little daughter had it in her heart. Somebody needs to do something. You know, I think so many times we hear about something needs to be done, we think, well, somebody needs to do that, or the government needs to do that, or the denomination, or whatever. Where it could be to just what is in front of us? Okay, little boy with a lunch. You know, all he had, just a little lunch. He gave it to Jesus. And 5,000 families were fed. So we embody love. When Jesus said, Matthew 25, truly I tell you, just as you did it to the least of one of these members of my family, you did it to me. So if we know love, love everyone, embody love, then we can start to live full. In, um, also in Ephesians chapter 3, Paul has this, uh, this great concept here. And he's talking about growing up as Christians. He said, uh, until all of us, church, come to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to maturity. That means grow up as Christians, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We live full by, as disciples, growing into the stature of Jesus. We begin to, um, to take on the family resemblance of Christ. We live full into the stature of Jesus. We live generously, um, and living generously is... Um, is assumed of God's people in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, um, in Deuteronomy, it says this. Deuteronomy 15, 11. Since there will never cease to be some in need on the earth, Jesus said in other words, you're going to always have the poor with you. This says, I there command you, open your hand to the poor and needy neighbor in your land. Live generously. And the last one would be to live sent. Now, I know the grammar might not quite work there. Um, but it means to live in such a way that you're ready to embrace an opportunity to do the Jesus thing. It might be just a momentary thing that has no follow-up at all. But maybe at a point in time, you are going to act like Jesus. Do the loving thing. The forgiving, the affirming thing, the caring thing, the helpful thing. You'll be like a part of the matrix that God is working in a person's life. You, know, you might not know how your need affected anything else, but you're going to be faithful to that time to live as Jesus lived. To live sent into any opportunity. Jesus said to them, Peace I, and this is near the, uh, also near the end of his earthly ministry, he said, Peace I give to you, as the Father has sent me, even so I send you. Wow. So, Jesus was sent on a mission to restore all the people of the world to God's original intention, to live in fellowship with God and with one another, and with the planet. He says, since I've been served to do this, now my plan is to send you. Well, I believe when we're doing these things, then the next thing, this is bold faith shift. This is our plan. This is the program. Bold faith shift. 
Now, we can all live this way. Now, I'm not saying that, that, that this doesn't mean that you have to be on a church committee and go to meetings uh, every night. Uh, you, you know, we've got about a thousand members in this church. They're not all here this morning, but they're on the, on the roll. We got them. Uh, and uh, that doesn't count the children. So we are really a force, a potential love force that can do a lot in this community. But you know what? The Christian brand in our culture today uh, has been suffering through, through the cultural wars. Uh, we've had hypocritical televangelists, blowhards uh, that are, you know, I... I, I was never listening to, uh, to Christian radio. Uh, it was just a confession. Um, and I was, uh, you know, I turned it on, I was listening, I was driving uh, to, a, to a preacher, and I was like, I haven't heard so much hate and anger in years. No wonder I never turned that station on. And I'm thinking, I just sure hope people are not saying uh, that I am like that. Um, or that the church that I serve uh, is that judgmental and angry at the culture. Um, we have Christian leaders who spent inordinate amounts of time um, condemning gays when Jesus never even talked about it. And ignoring the needy, which was the major message that Jesus taught and illustrated. We have young people who are bailing on the church, but some of those who haven't yet are kind of identifying themselves as Christ followers or Jesus followers rather than Christians because the word has so much baggage in our culture today. I think it's beginning to fade. And one way that I see it is I, I happen to be on the board of ordained ministry in our conference, and that means that I uh, interview many young people that are in the process of becoming uh, pastors becoming ordained, and I'm so <coughs> hopeful because I'm seeing these young folks that are coming in with the love of Jesus that want to make a change in Jesus' name in the world and in the church. And there's just a, uh, a quality of their commitment that encourages me. I think people are kind of tired, tired of public figures who uh, exhibit uh, narcissistic behavior, who are utterly self-absorbed in their quest for, for, pain, uh, for fame, for power. And then you add, right in the middle of all this mix, this weekend, I haven't been able to kind of get away from watching the news, uh, here comes Pope Francis. And he's drawn to the powerless. He focuses his message on love and mercy. And on issues like caring for this planet and working against human trafficking. And did you catch what he said? And I wrote this quote, Pope Francis said this weekend. I prefer a church which is bruised, hurting, and dirty because it's been out on the streets rather than a church which is unhealthy from being confined. He went into that basilica last night in Philadelphia. He said, wow. Cool place. Now, what are you doing out in the community? <laughs> I mean, they spent buckets of dollars on the building, and he was not impressed with that. He wanted to know, what are you doing for the cause of Jesus? How long the people live? Hmm. The church, he said, should be about love and mercy for all God's children. Um, I wonder what some of the evangelicals thought about that. So I, I, I read. Um, uh, Richard Stearns, who is president of um, World Vision, which is an evangelical relief agency. And um, he cites a passage of St. Francis' writings that he said should be required reading across denominations. He, he quotes this. I've been deeply grieved by the damage done to the reputation of Christianity in recent years by Christians shaking their fists at culture. This is Stearns. Then he says, perhaps the shortest definition of God in Scripture is from 1 John 4, 8. God is love. Then he says, Pope Francis is trying to show the world the simplicity of that revolutionary idea. Hmm. My, uh, my favorite country singer is, uh, is Jewel. By the way, uh, somebody told me this morning that um, 
the song that I that, that, that I quoted a month or so ago, you know, money can't buy you everything, but it can buy me a boat. That's the number one song now. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that makes me a prophet, huh? <laughs> This is not that. This is uh, Jewel, and she, she wrote this song and sang it uh, a few years ago, but it just really kind of in her spirit album. And the, um, the thing of the song is A Life Uncommon. And here's some of the lyrics. Come on, you unbelievers. Move out of the way. There's a new army coming, and we're armed with faith. To live, we must give to live. And lend our voices. I can hear her sing this. And lend her voices only to sounds of freedom. No longer lend your strength to that which we wish to be freed from. Fill your lives with love and bravery. And you shall lead a life uncommon. Are you living a life uncommon? Now, let me ask myself something, something that is sobering to me and, and maybe to you. What is my gospel? What is my gospel? In this chapter of my life, and in the chapter is going to start not to distant future, what is my central message? Isn't this the gospel that when others Not only hear the content, but the way I live it. If they say, I want that. See, I'm not talking about just a social gospel. I'm talking about living a life that you've come to because you are a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ. But you're doing everything that you can, asking for his help, for the Spirit's empowerment, for you to live into the characteristics of Jesus. And I believe that when you're doing that, consciously, regularly, sometimes someone's going to look at you and say, how in the world did you get that way? Why do you think that way? And what they're saying is, why don't you give me some of that? <laughs> and when you're doing that, you're boldly sharing your faith. <laughs> Let's think about it. Harbor Church and you at Harbor Church. Bold faith sharing. Jesus style. Let's pray. So God deliver us from self-aggrandizing programs from putting ourselves up by putting others down. But help us to intently follow the greatest and best that this world has ever known. Your Son, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That we might bear His likeness. And that through Him we may Join hands with one another in bringing transformation to our world. This is our heart's prayer. And in the strong, saving name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.